Okay. All right, Mike, over to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Mike DiPaolo, and this is my presentation on where I'm going to demonstrate a migration from uh, from the Pulp 3 Ansible installer, a deployment based on that, to a deployment uh, to the Pulp uh, single container. Oops, one second. And then, uh, and then uh, notes on how uh, it will work for Compose. Uh, so, yeah, this is my uh, this is my handle on IRC and everything. IRC, I mean IRC, uh, Element, uh, and basically GitHub, etc. So, so before I begin demonstrating, I want to give a proper a farewell to the pulp installer. Uh, the pulp 3 Ansible installer was created uh, to replace the pulp 2 installer, which was uh, RPMs uh, containing bash scriptlets. Because as such, it was not configurable. And you know, if the RPMs weren't available, that was for your uh, for your Linux distro. Well, then you had to install completely by hand. Uh, it also didn't support any sort of cluster-based, you know, in logic. You had to, you know, configure each and every host. And uh, so, the Pulp 3 Ansible installer was clustered, and it was very, very configurable. Over time, although I wasn't the original author, uh, the, like a very early version was created uh, already. Uh, it it grew not just for the needs of Pulp 3 as it added new features, but also with many uh, configuration options to both based on user preferences and in order to accommodate all their different environment configurations. Um, at times, there's lots of uh, you know complex code paths because we had to support you know uh, this configuration option set to Y, this configuration option set to B, this option set to set to L, and it it was very interesting and i developed lots of interesting ansible logic and i loved you know write it, i loved writing in ansible it's a very cool language it's declarative and i loved a lot of those problem solving like you know also writing logic for each of the linux distros but you know however the industry is moving more in the direction of containers so we have the single container we have uh, the compose which is still not which is the single container is, you know, like fully supported. Uh, the well, supported as an open source product does. The compose is still, you know, being developed and is a proof of concept mostly. The operator is also, you know, uh, considered mature. So by sharing, by using the single container, we also have share code with the operator, which is because the operator. This is quite significant for reducing our maintenance burden too. So I've really enjoyed not just developing Pulp Installer, but helping all the users over the years with it. I, I love being user facing like that. And I'll, I'll, and I'll, miss, I'll miss those days, but I'm also you know, st starting to develop a better appreciation for containers too. And by the way, this is a Viking funeral, which is quite appropriate for Pulp Installer. It's very, very epic and not, you know, not just, and not boring. So, so yeah. So, I, first, I'm going to show you that I did actually run Ansible installer. I mean, sorry, Pulp installer. Uh, so here, uh, I followed the quick start guide, uh, which many. Uh, we have our handy, uh, you know, terminal output here showing it running. You know, you. I'm not going to go over this in pretty detail because it's retired. Uh, go ahead, Grant. Mike, uh, can you uh, uh, increase the font size on both okay. your screen here and on your terminal window? That's good, right there. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah, this guy needs a little bit of help. I'm going to have to do this for each of my windows, but uh, ah, uh, or it's my tabs, but yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, let me let me do that right now, just so I don't forget. Because I'm going to be switching to each of these folders uh, later on. Right, this one's unnecessary. This one comes second, and then there's the 
Olha essa poeira. Muito bom. Ok, this one's light. Which one? Uh, is this good? Uh, maybe one, one notch okay. higher. Okay. I'm old. That's great, right there. Yeah. Okay. They're all the same now. Okay, so this is just a standard setup. Uh, the only thing that I modified and is uh. That I set, uh, I added specific versions of profile and pop RPM, and I'm adapting the command for uh, uh, the local host connection using not even using a, a an SSH connection, just running a commands locally. It's an Ansible mode. So, uh, so there's the command, and uh, so I've already run it, and you know Ansible is idempotent. Uh, so no, either one task which doesn't really change anything is going to report changed or nothing's going to report changed and i can safely let this run in the background uh as i continue the presentation so in order to demonstrate some content uh being you know uh uploaded and re retained in the in uh, noted in the database i'm going to run the pulp files uh, uh script so the pop file script uh, uh, synchronizes a, a, a file repository, and then it downloads the content after the fact. Uh, there, it's creating the repository, um, uh, syncing the content, uh, as a not dot iso file. Okay, it's it just synced it. And it's creating the publication and the distribution. And uh, you can ignore that uh, that SSL error, but uh, the content is available now. So I'm accessing pulp on HTTPS. And uh, yeah, there it is. We uploaded a file. Oh, I ran I ran upload by public sites instead of sync public sites, but either way, same content. It's same concept. Though there's a piece of content now, uh, and that it's you know it's it's important to note that the for the purposes of migrations that this content both exists on disk uh, currently under the you know the volume pulp directory, which is what the pulp you know user account uses. As, in addition to being uh, you know, described in the database, is both uh, the 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 the, the, store, the the file storage and the database have to be preserved every time we migrate, and have to be migrated properly. So there's our content. Um, I'm gonna run the uh, the sync one also just to get a little bit of diversity of content, and. Back over here, the pulp installer is still running, but it's identified, so it's not changing anything. And now we're gonna, now that we've we have our functioning pulp uh, pulp installer base set up, it's time for it to perform a, a big migration. I'm gonna go, so right now, pulp is running directly on my host system, and uh, let's just say that my host system is a variant of 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 rel eight or CentOS 8. Let's assume that for now. Uh, so we're, we're going to be migrating from like bare metal pulp to running in a container. Because remember, uh, so that, so this is a big migration. So I figured I'd show an example of a big migration in real life of wildebeest uh, migrating for many many uh, kilometers. Uh, so we have very detailed instructions for this that have been tested under a, a number of uh, distros. Um, it is available on the regular doc site, but there's a rendering issue with the table, so I'm just viewing it in GitHub's uh, Markdown Viewer for now. The, uh, this migration is has all these different steps, depending on what distro you're running 
and that's partially because the distros like store config files in different places, like except like putting you put the config for Postgres in its data directory under or under slash etsa, and also because the Postgres SQL is insignificant. So for EL8, we just say, well, we're we're going from Postgres 10 to 12, so we have to like you know dump and restore the database. So that's where that's the structure we're following for now. And you know, so we'll start with these instructions. Uh, and this is done running. So only one task report changed. It didn't actually change anything. Uh, and over here we have the ISO file. So that. Uh, there, that's a synced repository, and there's our synced re repo. Uh, so, so next, so we start these instructions. Um, first, we disable the pull-up core service, and we we stop it right now. And like I said, there's lots of code paths depending on what distro you're running. Uh, we do not, at this time, need to reconfigure Postgres to listen on all network interfaces because it's just continue listening on the Unix sockets in the in the single container. Um, next, we do need we need to dump the Postgres SQL database. And ignore that PSQL command. Uh, it's a harmless error. I mean, error. It's, it's a harmless error, but it really the command succeeded. And we're going to put that in the database dump in the Postgres SQL directory. Next, uh, we're going to disable all of the other uh, pulp related services and stop them at this moment. Postgres SQL, Redis, Nginx, they're all uh, stopped now. Uh, so now that we have, now that all the services are stopped, we are going to be operating out of the uh, pull OCI images directly, like the top of the instructions set, uh, say. And I'm going to move aside all of the currently directories that would conflict. Uh, but I already have my old stuff here. So. First, we move from our system-wide varlib pulp to the subfolder pulp storage. And then, because we're going to be running uh, the uh, single container as with rootless Podman, we have to change the ownership. It's going to be listed as uh, you know, user seven hundred from the perspective of um, of the container. So, if I see pulp storage right now, you'll see that hot, very high UID, which is part of the uh, sub UID scheme. But if I do this command to simulate a container, you'll see that it's UID 700, which is what the pulp user runs as within the container. Next, we move uh, the pulp configuration and certificates directory. And we uh, change it to uh, the pulp user 700. Uh, from the container perspective. And uh, this, this should not be necessary. Uh, it's the PostgreSQL data directory. Uh, we're going to. We're gonna, uh, Next, we're, now we're moving the, uh, the PostgreSQL data directory, which again includes the database dump.
And now I just need to create empty containers directly because that's just uh, like scratch storage. So well, I'll remove empty. Um, next, because we want to preserve the same configuration as pulp installer of listening directly in port 443, we're going to configure the system to allow that uh, to, so that my limited user account I can run listen on the port below 1024. And now we're going to restore the database. We have to do a restore because the, the Postgres does not support upgrading from 10 to 12 directly. Um, however, I should be honest. I actually I said I was running on EL8 variant with Postgres, uh, which would mean Postgres 10. In reality, I'm actually running on Fedora 38, which means Postgres 14. And although I say Postgres almost running on the host, that's because what I'm about to do is entirely unsupported, uh, which is dumping and restoring a database uh, from Postgres 14 and Postgres 13. And the reason why you're not supposed to do this is that when you dump a Postgres database, Postgres 14, uh, it has syntax that 13 doesn't recognize. If I had a very big database, there could be uh, a lot of syntax. In reality, there, but with this very simple database, there's only one field that it doesn't recognize. So I'm just going to have to manually modify the database dump so that it's compatible with Postgres 13. So as I used to say all the time on television shows, don't try this at home, kids. Uh, so I'm going to go back to, these, to this uh, database restore instructions. Uh, so, so I run a temporary version of the uh, pulp uh, single container, a couple of different arguments, like not publishing. Uh, whoops. OK, there, there we go. That's correct, yeah. So I'm now within the container. You know, it's a, it's a container. But, and it's, you know, it's a different distro because it's, it's a Post to my host over 38, it says. Uh, so, first, we're going to create an, a, a new, like, empty database. Uh, next, I'm going to uh, do more of the database initialization. I start, actually, start, I mean, it just starts the Postgres process. Next, I need to modify that dump file for my uh, you know, downgrade workaround. Of course, using the simplest text editor installed. And so this locale provided here is an example of a Postgres 14 syntax that's Postgres 13 to recognize. So I'm just removing that and saving. And now I can uh, restore the database from the dump. It's running a whole bunch of commands or, or, or you know, Postgres commands uh, like the PSQL normally would, you could directly put PSQL by hand and it succeeded. Now I st stop the Postgres process from the container and then I uh, can re the, the container should be stopped now and I can do, I can remove the container. This means removing any scratch storage basically. Uh, OK, and now we can run the container like normal. And now I mentioned like, you know, here, preserve, you know, using the port 443. And uh, if I do, if you look at the podman, I've, so this is the command. It's, uh, uh, you know, the only thing that's different from the stock example under the, uh, under the quick start is the port 443 and uh, HTTPS enabled. OK, now we can see how this container is starting with the logs. And because we went from just a pulp file installed and pulp IVM installed, and they're being in installed at old versions, uh, the old version was 3.21, uh, we are there's going to be migrations to run, although they, they do seem to be running pretty quickly. Uh, and they, they ran pretty quickly as I was testing this out earlier. So I think it'll be done in about one or two minutes.
uh, going back to the slides. So we did try that at home and it does seem to be working. And for the record, this is a great thing to try at your home lab. Just don't try it at work and your production setup. The, the Postgres downgrade. Uh, so, and just to show you, this is you know this is that command is based off of the uh, uh, the pulp single container instructions, and we, we do another name for the single container is the multi process image. You know that's the official source of the command. Well, that's the that's the Galaxy. I mean, there's the official source of the command, but it assumes you don't want HTTPS. And yeah, it looks like we're ready. You already submitted the analytics, which you can read about in the previous talk. <laughs> we learned about it in the previous talk uh, from yesterday. Uh, so we should be able to access our our content again. And just to show you that, unlike earlier when we only had two plugins installed, and there were you know, as Paul of course three dot twenty one. Now we have lots of plugins installed because they're built into the single container image. Uh, every single plugin we have that's considered stable. And you know, Redis and the database are running within the single container. They're managed by the S6 uh, process manager, like a much, much lighter weight version of system D. And we can get to our content. And voila, there's the Again, the the the, con, the text file that we manually uploaded, and here's this. These are the synced ISO files that's offering to download right now. And yep, <laughs> hooray! And again, uh, you know this this is only made possible because because of you know th we we migrated three things. We migrated the settings, including the certificates. Uh, we migrated the database. We migrated the content storage. And so the next step after this would be to migrate to, would be to migrate the data from to compose. Now this is being debugged currently. It worked recently. It's currently it's uh, we need to update the instructions again. I think it's for other certain distro configurations or for Postgres 13. However, the nice thing about compose is it's you know it uses the same data directories. Any changes needed will be very small. If, and we may even make them any changes needed unnecessary. Uh, you know, all you would to to use Pi and Compose, all you would do is install the the Pi and Compose man either from pip or from DNF. You would cd the directory, and then you would just run Pi and Compose up with the folders.yaml because folders.yaml says use folders on disk rather than uh uh your, your Pi man volumes. And of course, there's Docker Compose instead of Pi and Compose. Like all the instructions earlier, there is instructions for Docker and there's an man, rootless and rootful. And uh, the next step after this is a much, much bigger migration. You can almost say going to the great beyond. Yes, it is possible to migrate from uh, these smaller deployments to a, a pulp operator running in the Kubernetes cluster. The same concepts apply of just migrating your data uh, and there's two sources and changing any settings or you need to change and uploading any certificates you want to retain. So, you know, that's this is the future of pulp. It's it does feel like we're leaving we're leaving for another world when we de develop for, for a, a Kubernetes operator. So that's it for the presentation. Thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure all these years working on Pulp Installer and helping you all, uh, and working with everybody. So let's see who raised their hand. Um, Just go ahead, ask. And yeah, go ahead and ask. ask. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, I just pressed the wrong button. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, did anybody else? 
So that was a migration to the single container. That's correct. Yeah. And I'll put in capital letters too. Okay. And is is there like would one want to migrate to the not single container or like how would one decide whether one wants to migrate to single container or to multiple containers? I see what you mean. Yeah. So uh I mean, first of all, you do need to migrate off a of pulp installer at some point because it's not maintained. You know, it can't guarantee installs the latest version of pulp. I just installed, you know, pulp 3.21 with it because that's the last really supported version. Uh, single container versus multi-container. Well, I mean, the compose, the advantage of compose over a uh, over a single container is that it's yeah, that it's it's multiple containers, but however they're, all, however, they're all running on the host system and we do support configuring the number of workers and the number of like threads anyway. So the, it's not clear that there's like significant performance advantages versus reconfiguring uh, the single container. Uh, if, I, if I look at the docs for Paul Bosch images, uh, you, uh, you have, we do have uh, some of these ver the various variables listed, uh, like workers, yeah, see, Pulp workers, the number of pulp worker processes, pulp API workers, just the number of, I mean, these are actually not actually threads, they're sub processes, but still. So, yeah. But the important thing to note is like, you know, uh, pulp, the single container, we support as many configuration options as our users need. We try to implement them, although, our, you know, given our, the time we have, whereas with the, uh, Compose. It's more like here's a proof of concept. You can modify the compose for your for your needs. It's just less configurable in general. Okay, but it does sound like the single container is sort of the more trodden path. By far, yes. Yeah, and so unless I have a really good reason to want to use separate containers, I would probably just go ahead and go that well trodden path. Correct. Whereas the pulp operator requires Kubernetes, but is obviously it's really scalable, you know. Matthias? Um, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, Compose uses the same container images as the operators. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to the question slightly related to this talk, is there a migration path from a Podman Compose installation to the to a full cluster operator installation? So, I mean, there's no documentation on it, but I think it's very similar to what was demonstrated here. You got to bring the database to your deployment. <laughs> um, and the files somehow. And the certificates, yeah. Yeah, the okay. certificates, the necessary config settings have to be, <laughs> you know, not, you don't move the settings that YAML over, but you do have to account for those settings. Uh, mm -hmm. You have, you have you know, the database is straightforward. I mean, the file storage, you know, most Kubernetes clusters do not support having a file storage that's shared across multiple hosts. Uh, it's like, like uh, it's called read, write, mini that you need, uh, meaning multiple uh, Kubernetes hosts can write to the storage as opposed to read, write once, which is one host can write, every other host can only can read. So given that limitation, it's, you know, a lot of people want to use object storage, which is faster, which is more scalable anyway. And that would involve migrating from the, the you know, the, the disk storage to uh, object storage migration. Yeah. So you're saying if you're already on object storage, all those migrations are way easier. Uh, or, or at least have, have one pain oh, point yes. less. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. If you're already on object storage, that's, it, the entire process will be a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know we have an issue for migrating uh, the the files from one storage technology to another. I'm not sure it's merged already. Mm -hmm. Folks, um, I'm sorry. So uh, just to stay on the schedule, we have last, I, I see one more hand raised. So please go ahead. But it will be last question taking here. And then uh, we'll move on to the next talk. Thanks a lot. I try and be quick. Um, yeah, we have got a use case we're actually running in Kubernetes, but we want to run on a single host. So having it look similar would be nice. Mike, did you ever look at um, 
managing it out of system D as opposed uh, to Compose? Uh, you said managing like multiple containers via system D and handling the dependencies and everything there with it? Yeah, so you could start up and just run it on a single host that way. I mean, I'd be really excited to look into that. <laughs> it sounds fun. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Like, we'll meet you then. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, right now, the Compose is proof of concept. That would probably be proof of concept too, but uh, I'm, I'm very interested. Maybe it'll be easier to maintain something. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. and All right. I thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I encourage you to continue discussion either over chat or we have some free slots on Friday to talk about any topic we want. Uh, I will stop the recording right now and then we'll head over to Dennis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm.